Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Far Eastern civilizations in our continuing history of civilization. We've noted that civilizations tend to grow up around certain river systems. For example, in Egypt, we had the Nile. In Mesopotamia, we have the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, when we come to India, we have the Indus River system. Uh, but China especially is going to grow up around two major rivers. We have the Yellow River in the north, the Yangtze in the south, and these are going to be the two major river systems that tie this whole land area together to form it into one giant country. Here on this map, we're looking at the same rivers, but notice we've added also the Pearl River in the south, much smaller by comparison uh, and, and not quite as connecting as the Yellow and the Yangtze. Um, but these two, and if I can be allowed to say these three river systems, are going to be, have a great impact on the country that will eventually become China. <coughs> We're going back all the way in our early dynasties to the Xia dynasty. This is not to say there were no people in China before 2100 BC. There certainly were. But we're looking at the development of civilization. And with this dynasty, remember a dynasty is a ruling family. So we have this ruling family for roughly around 400 years. Uh, roads and irrigation beginning to be developed. Writing appears very suddenly during this period. Um, and yet it will take a very different look from writing the way it has developed in, in either Egypt or Mesopotamia with the cuneiform and the hieroglyphs, uh, or later on as that morphs and develops into a, uh, a very careful and, and systematic alphabet like we see uh, among the Phoenicians and the Hebrews and eventually the Greeks. Uh, those are those language systems. Uh, the language systems are very different, but the writing systems are connected uh, in a way that the Chinese writing systems are, are not. They're, they operated and still operate today very, very differently. The Shang Dynasty, another early dynasty from 1600 to 1046 BC, and we're, we're going to be able to get a little bit more specific on our dates uh, because now records are being kept on oracle bones uh, as a writing source. This is the Bronze Age as it appears in, in China. Uh, the Bronze Age in the Middle East had been quite a bit earlier, had, had begun and would continue throughout this period. Uh, wars with the nomads are becoming a regular thing, those that are from the north, and that's going to be a continuing theme in China. Indeed, we're going to see times when the, the, those nomads from the north come in and take over for a time, uh, but that's not happening quite yet. The Zhu Dynasty, uh, 1027 to 221 BC, so roughly about 800 years. This is going to be the longest of the dynasties of China, uh, this 800 year period. And this is a time of feudalism when you have the lands being owned by nobles, you have them worked by the serfs, uh, and, and yes, you have a ruling family, but it comes down to the local pockets of rule uh, in a sort of uh, feudalistic manner. Um, this is also the period of the Mandate of Heaven, where um, it is it is seen and understood that society is supposed to work a certain way where you it goes from from the top down uh the heaven whoever's up there um gives his his instructions um and, and that's that's above our pay grade uh to the to the local king and then to nobles and then down to the serfs and you're just supposed to uh, answer to the one above you uh, and that's the way the universe works. That's the idea. We also have Sun Tzu, his art of war, which has become and still continues to be required reading among military students today. But not only military students, uh, even those who are engaged in business will read this book because it talks about strategy and tactics and principles in overcoming your opponent. And and I suppose that there's a sense in which you have that sort of um, uh, I guess we could call it uh, capitalistic warfare for today. Um, so it's the art of war, but it, it has many different applications in both uh, actual war as well as business, as well as other endeavors. 
We see advances in religion, in philosophy during this period, and that's going to have an, an impact in China. One of those areas will be what's called Taoism. Now, the word Tao uh, comes from uh, Leo Tzu, uh, but the word Tao just means the way. Uh, and so he uh, teaches the way, and, and his big idea here is that you learn to live in harmony with nature. Uh, there are things that are positive, there's things that are negative, there's good and there's bad, and it's all one big happy family. Uh, and if I can just learn to balance all those things out, then I will be much happier uh, in the balance. If I can live to learn to live in moderation, in simplicity, with compassion, uh, and and learn to balance those various areas out. Now, Taoism tends to be polytheistic, but it's an impersonal uh, polytheism. It's not you know not that there's a bunch of like Zeus and Hermes and guys like that, but rather these different forms different forces in nature. Now, Confucius comes along, uh, 551 to 479 BC. He was a mid-level bureaucrat who decided to go into an early retirement, known for his wisdom, and he resigns his office to go and travel throughout China uh, because he, see, he sees this idea that in traveling, I get to have my eyes open and I get to see uh, other things the way other ideas uh, and if I can only learn to rule myself, then ruling the world, well, that'll, that'll take care of itself. But but it's this is sort of a grassroots idea. Let me start with myself, and maybe I can have an influence upon others as well. Uh, one of the quotes that for which he's known, uh, what you do not wish for yourself, do not do to others. That so sounds remarkably like what Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount, what we call his golden rule, where he says, don't do uh, or, or do unto others as you would have them do to you. Notice how Jesus states it in the positive. Confucius states the same thing, but in the, focusing on the negative, what you do not wish for yourselves, don't do to others. And Confucianism and Taoism can be compared and contrasted. Uh, you have the followers of Confucius, that's Confucianism, the, the followers of Leo, uh, Leo Tzu, uh, the, the way, uh, that's Taoism. In Confucianism, there is the idea of a belief. It can be one God. Now, it's not necessarily saying who he is, but the ancestors are worshipped because uh, uh, that's that's sort of built into it. I'm looking for the orderliness of society. In Taoism, there is no personal God. There's there's sort of impersonal forces and things like that. It's, it's polytheistic. Uh, Confucianism is all about having a structured society. Taoism is all about being at one with the way, the Tao, in order to experience immorality. In Confucianism, uh, it enforces and, and emphasizes social harmony. Taoism emphasizes the balance that we have in life. In Confucianism, uh, you can take those principles and use them to follow any religion. Uh, it's, not, it's not one religion specific. In Taoism, all religions are manifestations of the Tao, uh, at least so it claims to be. We have the Qin Dynasty, 221 to 206 BC, uh, relatively short as dynasties go, uh, founded by Qin Shi Huang. And he is the one who takes the title of emperor for himself. That's going to stick. Uh, others are going to follow. Uh, you know, once somebody's been emperor, other people want to have the, that same title for themselves. And these are warlords from northern China. Remember I said we're always having people from the north come down and invade and attack and take over. And that's what happens here during this period. Uh, all conflicting books are burned. So we have a heavy degree of censorship uh, taking place during this period. And we also have the beginnings of the Great Wall, what will eventually be the Great Wall of China. At this point, it's not quite so great, but it begins, uh, the construction on this wall begins and it's going to have quite a few twists and turns along the way. The, this dynasty led, left at, as one of its legacies, a entire army of terracotta. In other words, they are made of this clay earth, these clay warriors. 
an entire army that was buried with the emperor as his honor guard as he goes into the next life. He wants to take his, his stuff. His, he wants to take his armies with him. Uh, so maybe so that he can conquer, so that he can have first age for whatever reason. Um, he takes these uh, these clay soldiers with him and, and they are they are life size. They are full sized. Next, we're going to have the Han Dynasty from 202 BC to 220 AD, so about 400 years. Uh, it's during this period that the writings of Confucius, now Confucius had lived earlier, but now his writings are collected and educational requirements are set in, are set in place in order to hold public office uh, because we want an educated government and educated people that are working for the government. Uh, it's during this period that we have the invention of paper. Uh, now it's going to make its way to the West, um, at least as a as a oddity, but they won't be using paper in the West, right? At this during this period in history, they're using papyri, they're using animal skins, and those will continue to be in use for the next uh, several hundred years, uh, long after the Han Dynasty has come and gone. Silk Road opens trade to the West, which means that I have now uh, caravans going from China all the way to Rome. And yet that's a very, very long process. And each stop on the way is going to, to add its price. After all, you know, you, uh, you bring your goods through my territory. I want a cut of those goods. And so things coming from China are going to be very, very expensive, which maybe tells us why paper doesn't really catch on uh, in the West. Confucianism is dominant during this period. As we said, uh, this is a period where, where we want an educated uh, government, and it's certainly good for that government to, to hold to this way that says rule yourself and get along with society. That's, that's very, um, that's very much in the Confucian element of thinking. Buddhism also will be introduced from India during this period. And when we look at Buddhism versus Confucianism, of course, Confucianism originated in China. Buddhism comes from India. Confucianism uh, has this idea of ancestor worship, not that they become gods, but uh, that I honor them. Uh, I respect my superiors, whether he's the king or the governor or even my boss, the father, the husband, the elders, a respect for authority. Uh, and the goal is that we might gain social harmony and act morally in correct ways. Buddhism, by contrast, uh, ha brings with it these ideas of reincarnation and karma. What goes around comes around, and if I do good in this life, then, then maybe I'll get a little bit better in the next life. If I don't do good, I might come back as sort of a, a bad thing. If I live like a skunk, I might actually come back as a skunk. Um, uh, in, in Buddhism, suffering is a part of life, and I have to learn to endure it. Uh, material possessions are bad. Um, poverty is good, and if I can just overcome suffering by following uh, a very prescribed eightfold path, then I will I will succeed and perhaps come back in a better state uh, as we come back as we are reincarnated to a new life. The Sui Dynasty, 581, and notice I'm I'm jumping over some of these because. Uh, Prior to this, I'd gone through about 400 years of warfare between competing houses where I have a number of dynasties that are, are not clearly delineated. But now I have the Sui Dynasty, 581 to 618 AD. Uh, and here I have the establishment of agricultural economies for border defense because we're, you know, we're trying to uh, drive out the outsiders that, that keep coming in and messing with things and establish more of a normal kingdom. It's during this period that work begins on the Grand Canal. Now, this is eventually going to stretch 1,100 miles, linking the Yellow River to the Yangtze River, these parallel rivers, and yet they're parallel, not right next to each other. Uh, and this canal will link them, which means I don't have to sail all the way down one canal and out into the ocean and then back up the other canal or back up the other river, excuse me, in order to move my goods. And this is going to serve to unify China from the north to the south in the same way that the rivers have already unified China from the east to the west. 
Now, high taxes during the end of this period, after all, building canals like that and building these colonies all lead to high taxes, and they in turn lead to a revolt. Here's our picture. Notice the Sui dynasty. That's what we're looking at in the green. And yet I'm going to have next the Tang dynasty, and that's going to expand far to the west, uh, all the way up to the uh, Takli Makan Desert. And uh, of course, in the plains of uh, plateau of Tibet, that, that there are peoples there, but they're not going to be part of this country. So the Tang Dynasty, 6, 8, beginning 618, going all the way to 906, and we have a reunification of China with Li uh, Chimin. Um, he is the emperor in 626. Uh, when his father retires, he becomes the emperor, and he establishes um, uh, both education reforms, government reforms. Uh, it's rebuilding China to what it had perhaps wanted to be in the past. Um, now, after his death, we're going to have an empress, and this is quite always unusual when a woman takes power. Uh, this was not the norm, but Wu Zeo becomes the empress when her husband is, is incapacitated with a stroke in 655. Uh, she takes over, she rules, and when he finally dies, she takes the title of emperor for herself. And it's during this period that we're going to be to, to see uh, China at some of the biggest that we've seen it so far, uh, taking in that whole western section of China and unifying this entire country. Now, after her death, uh, industry and trade are going to flourish. We're going to see trade with Arabia, India, Japan, Persia, and ocean routes begin to take precedence. That's going to grow and develop. We're, we're not at its, at its extreme yet. But a rebellion takes place from 755 to 763. And the Tang Dynasty survives this, but it will be weaker. So I, we have the, uh, the Tang Dynasty in a strong period in the 600s. Uh, and then after the mid 700s, it's going to continue, but it will not have the it will not have the same strength. Um, when we finally get to 1162, and I know I'm jumping far forward here, I'm trying to just focus on the on the main uh, events of the uh, Eastern Kingdoms, uh, and we want to talk about Genghis Khan, uh, or, or as he would call himself, Temujin, the, the man of iron. Uh, he was a Mongol from the north, and he unifies those Mongol tribes, and once they are unified, then they come down against China, and he will conquer China. And so he conquers what by then is the Jin dynasty of China, and he sets up his own dynasty, or I should say his grandson does. And so we have the Yuan dynasty, um, beginning really with his grandson Kublai Khan, uh, who finally manages to unify China and uh, set himself up as the emperor, and he's engaging this in trade. And what's interesting is during this period, we have a European traveler. Now you'd other, you, I think you had probably had other people that had made that that um, that journey on the Silk Road. But the difference is that Marco Polo comes, he travels throughout China, he returns, and he writes about it. You see, if if somebody comes back and they don't write about it, then nobody knows what happened. But Marco Polo writes and his writing is copied. You still don't have the printing press yet, so it can't be taken to the printer. But this story in writing now begins to make its way around and people begin to hear about China and what, are, what is going on there. And China during this period has seen advances in, in science, in mathematics. Um, the successors uh, lose control over the Mongols because after all, who can control the Mongols? Um, but they continue to rule for the next uh, 100 years. Uh, in China, even though the Mongols are off doing their own thing. There's a gradual loss of power in succeeding generations, and finally we're ready for a new dynasty. And so we're going to next come, the Mongols are defeated, and we now enter into the Ming Dynasty, 16, or I'm sorry, 1368 to 1644. 
Uh, so roughly a couple of about 250 years. And it's during this period where the Great Wall is finally completed. It's stretching for many, many hundreds, many hundreds of miles over uh, very rugged terrain. It's uh, probably one of the, the greatest structures ever built to, to keep, uh, not to keep the Chinese in, but to keep the invaders out. That's the idea, uh, trying to keep out the noisy and not so nice neighbors. Uh, we also have during this period the Forbidden City, that is the capital complex built there in the city of Beijing, uh, stretching something like, uh, I forget how many hundred, you know, it's uh, over 100 acres um, that this uh, complex uh, stretches. Uh, and it's going to be, for the next uh, roughly about 500 years, it's going to be the, the political center of, chi of all of China. China develops an army of a million men, which is perhaps the largest army that anyone had seen up to this date. Now, the Persians had had, you know, some some huge armies in the past, uh, and we'd seen things like that, you know, among uh, Greeks and Romans, but, but nowhere to this size. We also have the construction, uh, not just of an army, but of a navy. As ships are constructed and a fleet of 300 ships is developed, and begins to go out and and make inroads not just of conquest but also of exploration and so we're going to see voyages to africa india maybe even maybe even to north america let's look at that on a map uh, a admiral uh, zhang hui he uh, is going to be uh, conducting these uh, these naval operations from 1405 to 1422 uh, will leave China and go and we're just going to look at his his southern and western routes initially uh, all the way down to uh, to Indonesia uh, he will explore the islands there and then he'll go west uh, past uh, India all the way into the Persian Gulf uh, to Persia and from there they're going to continue to the west up the Red Sea and all the way to India and at least a part way uh, around and, and going towards Africa. Now, those are his travels toward the west. Um, how far did he go to the east? And that is a subject of debate, uh, certainly to Korea, certainly to Japan, but how much beyond that? And some have theorized maybe all the way to the American continent, and, and it's anyone's guess how far south he went because because we don't have records that clearly tell about those things. And there were no lasting colonies that were developed, at least none that have survived uh, that we know about. Now, the Ming Dynasty then is seeing trade with Europe, not just on the Silk Road, but via these water routes, these ocean routes. And it's as a result of this trade that gunpowder, which was already a Chinese invention, now comes to the West. And they look and they say, what are we going to do with this thing? They, they come to realize, wait a second, if I put this, uh, this sort of thing in a narrow enclosed area, uh, I can actually make a gun. I can actually make a cannon. Um, and that's going to be put to use in the west with devastating effects uh, not just gunpowder but things like playing cards and silk and tea these all make their their routes but eventually the ming dynasty is going to go into decline and what will do this will be taking that trade and closing it down there's also some maybe some climactic issues at work you see, China enters into, not just China, but Europe as well, has what we call a little ice age, where there's a, a period of, I don't know if it's global cooling, I don't want to say dogmatically that that's the case, but at least in Europe and in, in Asia, there is a cooling trend. And you say, well, is that good? Is global warm? And I'm not going to get into it. is global warming good? But the little ice age actually is a part of the decline, both in China as well as in Europe during this period where there is a population decline because uh, cooler weather makes it harder to grow things, especially in those northern climates. 
Now added to that is European inflation, where money has been has been you know moving to you know, when I say money, gold has been moving to China to to pay for all those other things that are coming in. Uh, and so Europe is beginning to use other things for their money, and that means that they can they can um, they can move uh, they can artificially affect uh, what is considered valuable and what's not. And China, meanwhile, you know, of course, when you have trade, uh, there's Chinese goods that are going to Europe, and that's all well and good. But European goods coming to China uh, begin to dwindle, not because not because um, Europe is being stingy but because Europe doesn't have anything China wants. And so China is going to close the door to trade. Quoting from his book, Civilization, Neil Ferguson uh, says, from 1500, anyone in China found building a ship with more than two masts was liable to the death penalty. In 1551, it became a crime to even go to sea in such a ship. That is going to halt expansion that is going to halt sea trade as China closes its doors to overseas trade. Now, the Manchu rule, uh, the, we call that the Qing Dynasty, uh, but they are from Manchuria, that's the area to the, uh, to the northeast of China, uh, and they're going to rule from 1644 all the way up to 1912, and we're going to cut it short there. We're not going to get into the modern period of, of China. But uh, Manchuria conquers China and Indochina and Korea and Tibet, and this becomes all part of a becomes, becomes part of a kingdom. Um, the Taiping Civil War takes place from 1850 to 1864, and by this time, I'm beginning. I've I've already begun to have European influence, and this is part of that European influence where Christianity has come to China. And you think, well, that's good. Uh, except that there's a, a Hong Quing Khan who uh, supposedly converted to Christianity, but then he says, hey, I've decided that I'm the brother of Jesus. Uh, and so I'm starting my new religion and my new kingdom and uh, revolts against uh, the Manchu rule. And this leads to civil war where his followers took, take hold of Nanjing in the south. And this becomes capital, the, the capital city of this new movement. And it leads to a civil war, which is a total war. And civilians on both sides are targeted. And the casualties number in the millions. It has been estimated that during this civil war, uh, that the death toll it went from anywhere from 20 to 30 million people. After all, remember, it's Chinese fighting Chinese, so you can have casualties on both sides. But they're not just armies that are fighting each other. They're, they, they're civilians being targeted as well. This dynasty ends with the birth of the Chinese Republic, uh, 1912. We'll come back and look at that at a future time. But I want to close by looking at the difference between Western versus Eastern thinking, because we do think differently. You see, Western thinking, we have this idea that respect is earned. In Eastern thinking, respect for hierarchy is inherent, inherent in the way people are. People respect their elders, they respect their father, they respect their, their parents, they respect their governor, they respect the emperor. That's just the way things are. In Western thinking, open debate is encouraged in our society, in our culture. In Eastern thinking, open debate and confrontation are avoided. They have a saying uh, that the the nail that stands up is hammered down. We don't have that, that, that saying. In fact, we say it just the opposite. We say the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And notice two conflicting ideas. In Western thinking, it's very individualistic. Uh, even when we do things together, we do it as individuals and we, we take note of those people that are leaders. In Eastern thinking, uh, they're much more of a collective with regard to the way things ought to be done. In Western thinking, uh, we have this idea, follow your dreams. We actually put this in our movies and in our, in our bumper stickers and things like that. Eastern thinking, there's the, there's the emphasis of the duty toward others. Uh, it's more collective notice uh, toward others. Uh, in Western thinking, uh, conquer your goals, overcome, do those sorts of things. Eastern thinking, conquer yourself. Remember uh, how, how Confucius um, put that into their system of, system of thought.
Western values in government, impartiality is valued. Now, I'm not saying we always get it, but we value that in our in our judges, in our governors. It ought to be fair if it is impartial. Uh, Eastern values say, no, no, uh, there ought to be filial piety. Uh, that is, you ought to put your brother and your uncle and, and your family uh, into positions of power because that's just the way it ought to be. Uh, we refer to that as nepotism. They say, no, that's the way it's supposed to be. In Western uh, values with regard to government, the people make the decisions. You know, that's the democratic way. In the Eastern thinking, the sovereign leads. That's why he's sovereign. That's why he's boss. He makes the decisions. In the West, uh, we value diversity. In the East, they value the one way, where everybody really ought to be, ought to look, ought to dress, ought to be the same. In Western value, they value strength. In the East, they value wisdom. And I'm not saying that the, the West has no use for wisdom or that the East has no use for strength, but these are the values that they hold up as the ideal. Now, this brings up the question, Neil Ferguson in his book, Civilization, asked this question, what led the West to becoming the leader in civilization. And when I'm speaking of that, I'm speaking of up to the year 1912, because things are changing these days. And so we'll look, we'll ask the same question as the roles have maybe reversed in modern times, but I'm asking the question uh, in, in coming out of the Middle Ages and all the way up to uh, close to the modern age. Uh, the West did take over leadership. And some things that Ferguson points out, first of all, he points out competition due to political fragmentation. In other words, you have in Europe, not one united Europe. Oh, you have uh, times where that was attempted you know, back in the days of Rome and then uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. But for the most part, Europe was made up of a, a bunch of different tiny kingdoms and, and eventually nations. But they were always competing. They were always fighting with each other. And, you know, we have a saying in the West that necessity is a mother of invention. Sometimes you need to invent something so that you can survive against your noisy neighbor. And that competition actually led to a greater and greater strength. Secondly, scientific revolution took place in the West and it did not take place in the East, even though earlier some innovations had taken place in the East. Remember I said gunpowder came from the East and, and paper came from the East. And yet the scientific revolution that took place in the West did not touch the East initially. They were left behind. Thirdly, the idea of a rule of law which provides for private property. The concept isn't even there in the East, but it is in the West. It started, well, I don't know if it started this way, uh, but Rome had a rule of law. And then at a later date in England, for example, we have the Magna Carta which is the idea that the king no longer has authority. He's actually, there are certain things the king is supposed to do. And this idea had caught on, these, or I should say these ideas had caught on in the various countries of Europe, that the law should be obeyed. And even the idea that even the king is under the law. Now that, that didn't come in uh, into being, we're gonna see the growth and development of that idea as we uh, come back and look at European civilization. But that idea eventually did catch on. The advances in modern medicine, uh, medicine that grew up and developed in Europe, again, partially because they needed it, <laughs> because things were so bad that they needed advances in medicine. And finally, the idea of a consumer society where people will produce things that other people will purchase. And our society, even today, reflects that. Now, eventually, China's going to come on, you know, back today, there's a lot of things in my house that you can probably look at, and it'll say, made in China. But that had not been the case prior to 1912. And that is a very recent development. Finally, finally, the, the idea of a work ethic. And we'll see how this idea in particular, not the only one, but this idea in particular, will be brought to us via Christianity and one particular branch of Christianity, which will have not just a work ethic, but a Christian, and dare I say, a Protestant work ethic. But we'll see that 
in a future class.